Uh, thanks very much. Uh, we had a bit of a hiccup, but hopefully you'll enjoy this presentation. Uh, and the topic of this presentation is automated detection of software bugs and vulnerabilities in Linux. So who am I and where did this talk come from? Um, I'm a PhD student at Deakin University. Uh, my research interests uh, include malware classification, primarily using static analysis techniques. Um, and I, di I did a talk yesterday for the professional delegates, if there were any that saw that. Um, I also look at bug and vulnerability detection, um, sometimes using static analysis, but in, in this research I, I don't use static analysis. I, I use a different approach. Um, I presented at Black Hat, Kansak West, um, Ruxcon uh, for previous years. Um, and, yeah, and this presentation is some of the research that I'm doing at Deakin. So uh, I mentioned slightly that that I do have other research doing bug detection using static analysis. And, and the basic approach with that is combining decompilation with traditional techniques to find bugs. Um, and basically that entails typically abstract interpretation. Um, this isn't the focus of this talk. I'm just talking about some previous, some other work that, that I have, um, but is related to this. Um, and that system has found bugs and vulnerabilities in Linux. Um, I plan to submit research papers, um, and it is under active development. So on to this talk, um, just an outline. I'll just introduce uh, some general uh, discussion about bug and vulnerability detection. I'll discuss what exactly I'm trying to solve in this, paper, in, in this presentation um, and the general approach that I'm using to do that. Um, then I'll look at the methodology of how the system works, how I implemented a system uh, to find bugs and vulnerabilities, and that entails embedded package detection, related packages detection. It doesn't really matter at this point if, if those terms seem unfamiliar. I'll explain that as we go through the presentation. Um, I'll evaluate the system that I've implemented, that, that, and it has found bugs, about 30 bugs, low impact bugs, but it has found about 30 bugs and vulnerabilities uh, in Linux distributions. Um, and I'll talk about some discussion points points of interest that, that are relevant. Uh, I'll, I'll end the presentation with availability. The, the project is open source. I'll talk about that, talk about some future work, um, and conclude the presentation. So onto, the, onto the, the meat of it. So software defects are a major cause of internet insecurity. Um, I think everyone is aware of that. There have been a lot of high profile attacks that have primarily come from, from some software defects and vulnerabilities. Uh, I think detecting software defects uh, improves security. Um, patching is, is a good thing. Um, sure, we patch a lot, but I think that continual process of finding bugs, finding vulnerabilities and patching them does improve security. If we can, if we can find those bugs very early on, um, early on in the development process and the QA process, we will have more secure code, and we won't have those, those patch cycles that occur. So it, it's an important area of research to, to automatically detect these bugs as a development process and a quality assurance process. There are a number of traditional uh, methods uh, from, from formal methods uh, to detect bugs and vulnerabilities. We had things like theorem proving, um, and if we look at uh, people might have heard of that secure kernel that was, that was proven to be free of certain particular runtime bugs by Nikta. Um, they base this on, on constructing verification conditions and using axiomatic semantics and, and all logic to, to, build, to build proofs that, that, that asserted the correctness of the program. Um, there are other approaches such as model checking, and model checking essentially enumerates over the state space of a program. And, and looks for, for specific properties of that program being true or not. So you have a, a model of, a, of something, and you have a specification defining certain properties that are proved to be true or, or, not, pro, or not true. And that's done with things like temporal logic formulas and whatnot. Um, other approaches are static analysis. The, probably the most sort of well-known is abstract interpretation. And that's basically the, the sound approximation of programs. So, Sure, we can't say exactly, precisely what a program's uh, behavior or properties are, but we can approximate those, that behavior and properties um, with abstract interpretation. So my, my work in this research doesn't look at those traditional methods of, of bug detection. And, and sure, formal methods have had some use. Um, formal methods have proven, uh, for example, the Airbus uh, flight controller software was 
was proven to be free of runtime bugs. Um, it was a subset of C and it was proven by abstract interpretation. So those formal methods do work in, in, you know, in certain instances. The approach that I'm taking is very informal um, and it looks at embedded packages. Um, so the problem that I'm looking at is developers may embed or clone code from third party projects. So for example, Firefox embeds libpng, an image processing library. Um, other software might statically link against an external library like Zlib or libpng again, or it might maintain an internal copy of a library source. So Firefox has an internal copy of libpng in the source tree. Um, a software might fork a copy of a library source. Um, and there are lots of examples of this, Zlib, libpng, libtiff, you know, expat, xml, passing libraries and whatnot. Uh, Zlib is the classic example. It's used in so much software and it's primarily, I think, because of its permissive license and its general usefulness. Um, the, the permissive license allows the software to be used uh, in closed source proprietary software. So lots of, lots of software makers have incorporated Zlib and equivalent libraries into their own source tree. The, it's, Generally, though, a bad practice to embed, you know, a, a, a second copy of a library in your source tree. Um, and Linux package policies generally allow this. Most distributions have policies saying, do not embed a copy of a library in your source tree. Use a dynamically linked library instead. And the reason that it's bad is that two versions of the library need to be maintained. Um, you know, instead of just resolving one fix in an in the, in the system-wide library, now you have to incorporate fixes to every instance of that embedded copy of that library. Um, and generally, these embedded libraries uh, tend to get out of date. And as they get out of date, security vulnerabilities uh, happen to them. Um, so this causes insecurity. A classic example is, is Zlib again. I keep on mentioning that it's, it's, it is such a widely used library. Um, back in 2005, they had a, a remote code execution bug um, in Zlib. Um, Debian um, wanted to know which software embedded Zlib. They, they didn't know, but they just assumed that there was a lot of software out there in, in their package repository that embedded this vulnerable library, making all these packages insecure. So what Debian did, Debian Linux, is that they created manual signatures to identify uh, this particular library. Um, then they did a scan of the, re of the package repository, all the binaries in that repository, uh, to identify uh, that embedded code. Um, they actually created a clam AV signature, so a virus signature, and used antivirus software to, to detect it, which is sort of interesting. Um, they did find that there were many vulnerable packages. Lots of, lots of software was embedding this library. Lots of software was insecure. More recently, uh, LibTIFF earlier in the year um, was found vulnerable. But, you know, LibTIFF is, is used in a lot of software as well. So, you know, no one is scanning, you know, all the, all the packages for, for LibTIFF bugs or other bugs, you know, resulting because of these libraries. So, so how do we know how many packages are vulnerable? You know, this is a way to find bugs. So the Zlib signature that was created was, um, was effectively based on, on, on a version string. Um, if you want to create a manual signature for, for a library so that you can scan a binary to see if it's, that library is embedded, uh, you can look at the version strings in the source code. So I've got three version strings that can be used as signatures from um, BZIP2, a BZIP2 library, which is a compression library, a libtiff, which is an image processing library, and libpng, which is, which is another image processing library. And if you, just take a, if you just take a package's source code, you can just grep it for, for, for version, you know, without regard to, to case. Um, and you can find a version string that you can probably use to create your own manual signature and then scan packages and binaries for that. So is it still a problem? You know, Zlib was in 2005, that's a really old bug. Um, you know, it's, it's not really a problem anymore, but are there other, you know, issues with, with other libraries? So, you know, we made signatures for BZIP2, LibTIFF and LibPNG, which all had advisories reported against them for, for various insecurities. Um, we scanned the, the entire uh, package repository, the binary repository of Debian and Fedora Linux, 
Um, and we found by, by vulnerable packages using particular versions of these libraries uh, that were known to be vulnerable. And that, so, so it was, you know, it was quite interesting. Um, one particular application that sort of raised interest was Firefox. So this is a major application. Um, and what we saw was that um, Firefox embeds libpng, and there was this window of opportunity um, where libpng, a libpng vulnerability had been, had been released. Um, and Firefox wasn't aware of that until about three months later on um, when they finally sort of put on the mailing list, oh, we've, you know, we found a bug in, there's a bug in libpng, we think you know, we should include a patch. Um, in the Firefox copy of libpng as well. So even for a major application, we see these windows of opportunity um, because there's no automated you know, processing going on, so it's really up to developers to maintain you know, knowledge of, of what embedded libraries in their tree are insecure and, you know, and watch security updates. It's a big problem. Like when, we, when we think about how do we you know, tackle this problem on a, on a distribution, um, Fedora and Debian have more than 10,000 packages, you know, in each distro. Um, so, so, you know, there are a lot of packages to track. Um, Debian Linux actually maintain, you know, a manual, uh, manually created uh, tracking system of, of embedded packages. Um, and there are 420 libraries or packages that are embedded in other software in Debian that they track. So, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of libraries. It's not just lib, you know, Z, lib, lib, PNG, and lib. We're talking about 420, you know, packages. Other distributions don't track at all. Um, you know, Debian is really probably one of the one of the better distros that, that track these things. Uh, Fedora um, weren't tracking this information before we sort of gave them uh, information on this, and, and and then they started to use our research to create a wiki um, of embedded packages. Uh, to automate the process, is, we, we really do need an automated process, manually tracking you know, 420 embedded libraries that we don't even know about if we, if we don't track it in 10,000 plus packages is a challenging task. It's time consuming. Um, you know, we really do need an automatic way to identify embedded packages. Um, and if we have that, can we find bugs automatically from those relationships, the, those embedded packages that we know about? So that gets on to, to, what, to what we've done in this particular work. Uh, we define the problem um, in, a, in a more formal sense. It's been well known about for a long time, this embedded package problem, embedded library problem. We just make it you know, more to the forefront that we, can, that we can define the problem and try to solve it. Um, we propose algorithms to identify embedded packages from a distro. Um, we also propose algorithms to infer outstanding vulnerabilities, and I'll go into detail about all these points throughout the present, you know, further on in the presentation. I'm just giving an overview of, of what our contributions are. Uh, we implemented a complete system that, that actually is useful. Uh, the results are being used by vendors, um, and we identified about 30 um, previously unknown vulnerabilities. So there's related work to, to this particular problem. Um, when we think of embedded code or, or, or cloning of code uh, between software, um, there's related work in plagiarism detection, which is basically uh, cloning of code, again, or copying of code or duplicating of code uh, between software you know, for, for student cheating purposes and whatnot. There's also code clone detection, which is the process of detecting duplicate fragments of code within a particular source stream. The idea is with code clone detection is that if you have duplicated fragments of code in a source tree, it becomes hard to maintain because you have that, that same sort of problem. You have to maintain lots of versions uh, you know, of this particular code snippet and, and you, you have that inconsistency you know, very easily you know, that can occur because of that. There are a number of approaches that have been used. You can consider source code as a text stream without regard to syntax or semantics. You can tokenize uh, the source code and get keywords of source and use that as a, as a feature. You can build abstract syntax trees, which describes effectively uh, the grammar of, of a source code, and then compare those trees to show similarity between duplicated code fragments or duplicated source. And then you can combine syntax and semantics with program dependence graphs, which effectively combines control flow and data flow. But, and it's equivalent. You, you find graph similarity to show similarity between uh, code or fragments of code. 
So onto the, the problem statement, what we are actually trying to do uh, and what our approach is. So what we want to do is, is the first problem, there are three problems. The first problem is to determine if package A is embedded in package B. So if we have Firefox and we have libpng, we want to know is libpng embedded in Firefox. Another problem that we have is we want to find clusters or sets of packages that share code. So given a, a, a Fedora Linux distribution, we want to find all sets of packages that share a common library. The third problem is we want to infer vulnerabilities using advisory information and those relationships that we determined from problem one and problem two. So uh, the very quick overview, and I'll go into more detail later on, um, we basically look at source packages. We're not looking at the binary problem now, we're just looking at source code, so we have to take that into account. Um, now what we consider is that the source tree of that package, uh, if that's a subset of another source tree, then that package is embedded uh, in that other package. So if, one's, if, one if one source tree is a subset of another source tree, it's embedded. And the second problem, the second problem that we're tackling is finding those clusters or sets of related, of related uh, packages that share code. Um, well, packages that share files are related, so uh, if Firefox has a, a list of file names and libpng has a list of file names and they match each other, then there's a relationship between libpng uh, and Firefox. So we use file names throughout this approach. It's, it's a very sort of simple way of, of looking at things, but file names are a key. Now, if we graph the relationships between the packages that I, that I just talked about, we can identify related packages as clicks. I'll, I'll talk about what, what this graph of relationships are uh, and what these clicks are as well. The third problem, inferring vulnerabilities. Uh, well, we have three approaches to this. Um, well, packages that embed clones or embed libraries inherit their vulnerabilities. So Firefox should inherit all of libpng's vulnerabilities. Now, that's not always the case. You know, you might have vulnerabilities in libpng that can't be triggered when it's embedded in Firefox. Um, and that's a source of false positives in our system. But for the most part, we'll accept this. And, and you know, it, it's, it, it's useful that, you know, it's a useful approximation that we get value out of it. Um, packages that share clones share vulnerabilities. So if you have a set of packages that all embed libpng, then they all share libpng's vulnerabilities, which is sort of similar to the first problem. Uh, the, third, the third way that I'm looking at uh, is equivalent packages between distros share vulnerabilities. Now, say you have uh, Firefox in Debian Linux, and it has a vulnerability. Now, you should expect the same vulnerability to appear in Fedora Linux. Now, that's not always necessarily true. There are sometimes distribution-specific vulnerabilities. But for the most case, if there's an equivalent package between distributions, then they should share the same vulnerabilities. So onto the first problem. How do we detect if package A is embedded in package B? So again, we look at the source packages. You know, we're not looking at the binary problem. We're looking at source trees and source packages. Uh, file names in source tend to be the same between software versions. That's an observation. You, you, you have typically the same file names. Um, you know, it's not always true. Sometimes there, there is a large variation. But in the most case, you, you have some similarity between each version of software. And in different versions of software, they have some common subset of file names. So effectively, what I'm saying is file names in a source tree are a feature that we can use to identify a particular software. We should ignore frequently used file names, things like make file, readme. These are in almost every package, and they don't really add any discriminative power to, uh, to the system. So I don't know if you can read this. Um, it's just two packages, expat, which is an XML parsing library and is a commonly embedded in lots of software, and another package on the right, which is TLA. Um, and we see that within these two particular packages, a lot of file names are shared, um, and those file names come from the expat library. So, so to, to sort of to more formally to, to define the problem, uh, we treat the source tree of, of the package, their file names, uh, as a set. 
Now, package A is embedded in package B if the majority of set A is a subset of set B. So the, the formal description of this is set A is embedded in set B if the cardinality of the intersection over the cardinality of B is, is greater than a threshold. Um, the intuitive understanding is, 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 is perfectly fine. Um, if one set is a, largely a subset of another, is largely a subset, um, it's embedded. And so a visual depiction of that is on the bottom where we have that one package, those set of file names in red is a subset of that, of that larger circle. So we can say that that package, which is a set of file names in the source tree, is embedded. So that, that's, that's, that's the first approach. It's a simple approach based on file names treated as sets, and you can determine if a package is embedded in another package. And mind you, we have to remember that things like Debian Linux, you know, this is all manually you know, tracked. They don't, they don't have an automated system at the moment where they're automatically discovering embedded packages. So there is use for it. So how do we detect uh, a group of packages that share code or share a library? Uh, what we do is we match file names between those two packages. So you know, if, lib, you know, if libpng and, and Firefox share libpng.c, you know, then there's some sort of relationship. Um, now, we can improve this slightly by looking at the content of, that, of those common file names and verify that the content is similar as well. So to do that, we use fuzzy hashing and then compare the, the hashes to see if they're approximately equal to each other. And we use SSC to do that. So effectively, we're just verifying that there is similar content shared between two packages. So more formally, package A and package B are related if two packages share at least X number of files with similar content. OK, so we can draw this as an undirected graph. If we take a Linux distribution, we build all these, we identify all these relationships, you know, package A and package B are related if, um, and then we draw an undirected graph. Each node in the graph is a package, and an edge between nodes um, means that those Packages are related to each other. Uh, this is a, a, a visualization of the package relationships uh, in Fedora Linux. Uh, it looks a little bit like a splatter graph, but there is there is some meaning to this. On you know, I, I, if if we look closely, um, the, the visualization isn't good because the graph is so large. It, there's over ten thousand nodes and edges in the graph, so there's lots of you know, it's not perfectly laid out. But we, what we can identify. Are there, are there, there are these dense circles in the graph um, of interconnected nodes. Um, and they're, they're splattered all over the place, but there are these distinct you know, interconnected dense circles. And those dense circles are, are, are clicks. A click is a complete subgraph with edges between all nodes. Now, clicks in our package relationships graph identifies code that is shared. Um, so all those nodes in that click, which are packages, all share code with each other. Uh, maximal clicks in the graph, which means that you can't get a click any larger than this particular click, um, identifies the larger sets of packages that share the same code. Now the click problem is, 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 is a hard problem to solve. Um, it has a complexity in MP, so it's generally infeasible for, for large graphs. It's hard to approximate. Um, so you don't have that, that guaranteed of, of, of an approximate solution. Um, but heuristics make it practical. And so we used a tool called CFinder, which is a, I think, I think it's actually called Community Finder. It finds community structure and graphs, and it's, it's used for social network analysis and things like that. But we use it um, to solve the click problem here. So that's, that's how we identify clusters or sets of packages that share code with each other, identifying clicks in the graph and those nodes or packages, uh, other sets of the nodes, uh, those, that click identifies the set of packages that share code. So that defines how we, how we build relationships. You know, how do we know if one package is embedded in another package? Which packages you know, share code with each other? We want to now extend this um, and use this information to find vulnerabilities. So. This is what I was saying earlier. If a package A is embedded in package B, 
then B inherits A's vulnerability. So if libpng is embedded in Firefox, Firefox should inherit all of libpng's vulnerabilities. It's not entirely 100% you know, accurate, and this is a cause of, of some false positives, um, but it's, it's, it's suitable for, for our purpose. And we, there's a small algorithm for that for each vulnerability, B and A, B not in B report, B is potentially vulnerable to B. But the, the, the key point is that there's, a, there's an inheritance. So if we know a relationship between Firefox and libpng, and we know all of libpng's advisories, um, and we know all of Firefox advisories, we can identify you know, CVEs that haven't been reported uh, you know, in Firefox if, if they're in libpng. Uh, the second approach that, that, that I'm using, uh, if 80% of related packages, this gets back to those sets or clusters or clicks you know, in, in, that, in that relationship graph. If 80% of related packages are vulnerable to a particular vulnerability, X, then the remaining 20% are probably also vulnerable, but they're just not reported. Um, so, so that's the basic methodology. If we have a set of packages, and 80% of them are vulnerable to, to libpng, cve, one, two, three, four, then the 20% that, 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 that don't report that libpng vulnerability, you know, they probably should report that because it's likely that it is vulnerable to that bug. Um, the, the, the issue that we have with this is that um, different packages have different CVEs. There's no such thing as a, a canonical upstream like libpng, cve that defines Firefox vulns, the Thunderbird vulns, each application gets its own CVE, even if the, the root cause of, of the bug you know, is, is from one upstream source. So the, the, final, the final approach that I'm using to find bugs and vulnerabilities um, is when we have you know, a vuln in Firefox um, on Debian. You know, Fedora should probably also be vulnerable to that. Uh, so if a package A in a Linux distribution DA is vulnerable and there exists a package B in distribution DB and the two packages are equivalent, like if Firefox in Debian Linux is roughly equivalent to Firefox in Fedora Linux, then, then both distros should share the same vulnerabilities. But how do we know if two packages are equivalent between distributions? Because the names might be different. Um, it's quite common to have slightly vari slight, diff slight variations in the naming convention between different distributions. So we need a way to automatically identify if one package between one distribution is the same of another package in another distribution uh, without regard to their, with their package name. Um, also, you have things like the same package name, but the actual packages are completely different. Um, so again, we use the source tree of those packages and we treat the file names in that source tree as a set, uh, and we use a set similarity measure. Uh, one particular measure that we can use is called the jacquard index, um, and you can basically define set A being similar to set B if the jacquard index is greater than a threshold. There's also a variation on that, the jacquard distance, um, which has the properties of the metric, which means that if you have a database of packages and you want to find all similar packages to a query, uh, you can perform that, that, that database search um, efficiently. So th that's the basic approach. Uh, that's, that's the methodology. That's you know, the, the, the algorithms, the ideas behind it. Um, I'll go into the evaluation and discussion now. Um, I implemented this uh, in a complete system. It's about 6,000 lines of code of, of a mishmash of C++, Python, and shell scripting. It's not very well coded, to be honest, but um, it's, you know, it's OK. Uh, there's about 4,000 lines of, of visualization code where I did that graph relation, that package relationships graph. That, that comes from the visualization. Um, file names, are they a good feature? I mean, that's an assumption that we're making in this, in this particular presentation. You know, um, so how do we know if they're a good feature? Uh, well, the National Vulnerability Database, which stores basically advisory information for CVEs, um, has summaries of particular vulnerabilities, um, and they reference file names, vulnerable file names uh, in these summaries. So if we look at this particular summary, it's an off by one error in a particular function in readrec.c, which is the file name of interest. So what we did, uh, we scanned the National Vulnerability Database 
for file names that match uh, particular source, source code like files, C and C++. Uh, and then we scanned uh, all of Linux of a particular distro, all the source for those file names to see if we could identify duplication of bugs. Um, if, if, if a package that, that has this vulnerable file name doesn't report a, CV, a vulnerability that includes this file name in the summary, then we report that it might be vulnerable. Um, and we found nine vulnerabilities using, using that method. Um, one particular like, bug of interest that we found was an off by one in, uh, in a one-time uh, authentication, uh, one-time password authentication for libpam in FreeBSD. Um, the, original, the original advisory was in FreeBSD, and we found the bug actually in Debian Linux. Um, the, we, we didn't actually uh, refine the, the original NVD search to by, by operating system, so we found also, it's interesting that we found, you know, not just a bug in a different distribution, but a different operating system based, you know, on the same file name. Um, these are the, the bugs that we found using, using this system. Um, they're all low impact vulnerabilities, to be honest. Um, you know, there's nothing particularly you know, special about any of the bugs. But it is interesting that the system did find bugs. Um, and so, so we think there's value in that. Um, there were some PHP bugs, some C bugs, uh, the XPAD XML parsing library, libsif, libpng, things like that. Um, and this was in Fedora um, and Debian Linux. We also found some, some vulnerabilities that had been patched in the unstable versions, but we were only working with the stable versions. We didn't report that in this. Um, an interesting vulnerability that we found was um, security enhanced Postgres SQL in Fedora. Um, and the version that they were using was actually a fork of a beta version of Postgres SQL. And we detected that as an embedded relationship. And the beta version had a post authentication tickle bug, um, tickle code execution bug. Uh, which was sort of interesting. Um, that cross-distribution thing that I was talking about, where you have, you know, Firefox in Debian has the same volume as Firefox in Fedora. We did a one-time scan of, of Fedora and Debian, and we found one unreported vulnerabilities in Debian's uh, Genie Cache package. Um, I, I think, like, if, if we run this at regular intervals, we'll probably get a supply of bugs. Maybe they won't be high quality bugs, but we'll probably get bugs and vulnerabilities that are useful uh, for developers to fix. Uh, there are some practical consequences to the work we did. Fedora Linux are now using our embedded package results for, for a database stored on, on a wiki. Um, Debian Linux, once we started reporting these types of bugs and these relationships, they gave us subversion right access to incorporate our results with their own database that they use for tracking. And you can get a copy um, of those embedded library relationships. Um, embedded code copies is what Debian calls it. Uh, there's some interesting things that, that should be mentioned. Um, Fedora reports related CVEs in an advisory. So if Firefox has a libpng vulnerability, it'll report Debi uh, Fedora will report the CVE for Firefox and libpng, which is actually very useful. It makes our analysis work. Um, ideally, I, I, I really would like to, to think that we could see CVEs have a canonical um, version. If, if, if there's an embedded library that is vulnerable, it should report a canonical version of that library you know, in the CVE information. I think that would be useful. Um, possibly we could use a CPE identifier, which is a way of uh, canonically labeling software. Um, so it would be useful in reports, and it would be useful for these types of analysis. Um, also, another interesting thing is linking package names to CPEs is useful. Debian actually um, maintain a tracking of, of, pa of native package names in their, dist in their repository to CPE names. Um, and the reason that they do this is that when an advisory is released um, in the NVD, the CVE is released, um, they report the CPE associated with it. So Debian look at these CPEs and then they verify that they've patched all their software matching CPE names uh, to their native package names. Uh, Fedora Linux weren't particularly interested um, in our... Um, and I, on, on, in our submission of, of that relationships, um, yeah, and most distros don't don't link those names at all. 
So, on to the, the final stretch now. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to publish some academic research, uh, some papers on this. Um, I haven't done that yet. This is the, the first um, presentation that I've, that I've given on this work. Um, I'd also like to integrate the, the system with um, with when developers package software or, or in a build process so that they can get, you know, immediate and, you know, actionable, useful information. There is some sort of, there is a little bit of this being done already, but it's really ad hoc and it's, it, it's, it's only for, for specific, you know, checking for specific libraries, you know, and not so many of them. Um, I'd also like to do binary analysis for Windows. Um, you know, there's bound to be a ton of, of, of closed source software that embeds vulnerable you know, libraries, and so this is, uh, would be a great source to find uh, lots of bugs and vulnerabilities. So in conclusion, um, I detected embedded packages and found vulnerabilities, demonstrated results on Linux. There's an open source release, which I'll mention in the next slide, uh, and really I think it, you know, this, this type of work benefits vendors and improves security. Um, there's a complete but unbuildable system you know, there's a snapshot of the source, but you wouldn't be able to build it out of the box, but you can have a look at it. It's open source. Um, if you go to the research page that I've got here, um, you can look at it. Um, also get a book next year um, on software similarity and classification, which overlaps you know, code clone detection and plagiarism detection. Um, and I've also got a wiki uh, reviewing uh, literature uh, on, these, on these topics. So that, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, it's, it's, it's high. There's a lot of false positives. The, the way that I look at like, evaluating this is, given someone that is skilled at, at, at looking at bug reports and, and fixing bugs, do they get value out of, out of these reports? And do they actually find more bugs you know, looking at reports with a high number of false positives? Um, so you know, most of these bugs were, you know, it wasn't like months and months of going through bug reports. It was more like you know, days, half a day to a week going through bug reports and finding, you know, tens of vulnerabilities. So, you know, the, it, is, it is a massive number of false positives, but if you, if you know what you're looking for, you can quickly, you know, rule out, you know, things that, you know, that l look ridiculous and you say, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, potentially something that I should follow up. So in that sense, I think that there's still value in the system, even though we do have a high false positive rate, but it is very high. And, and like, the, the, and it varies. The, the, the embedded packages detection is, is probably better than the vulnerability detection. I think that one of the issues is that because advisories, we were just scraping the, the Fedora um, mailing lists to, to receive advisory information and then extracting all CVEs using like regexes and stuff um, to find relationships. If there was a more formal way of, of, of maintaining this type of information, I think we'd have less false positives. But it's, it's you know, it's sort of, it's really quite fuzzy because they're just scraping advisories and trying to extract information and correlate that to, to our data. But, yeah. Uh, put up your hand for a question. Anybody? Put one at the back. Um. Uh, Thank you. It's a very interesting uh, conference. Uh, I've been working lately in a very similar approach, and I got a couple of questions, a couple of ideas. Uh, have you thought on the caveats of the problems involved, and in where there's some obfuscation layer of uh, software applied? And uh, in the approach I've uh, I've been using, we also uh, use an emulator. Uh, to run uh, through different architectures, the binaries we are trying to compare to dump the uh, contents of RAM uh, to find uh, behavioral uh, approach uh, similarities between the, the binaries. Have you thought of something like that? Um, I, it is an interesting thing. I, um, like if you look at you know, things like um, software theft detection, um, you, know, you might find, like it's probably a good area of research where they, where they do this type of stuff, where they might have one particular library that they're trying to detect reuse of in other software. So some approaches are doing a dynamic analysis and extracting certain features and looking for overlapping of, of those features um, or replication of those features. So, so I think you know, software theft detection is, is an area of research which has a, has a lot of overlap with this. 
Um, I, I think you know most of the software similarity at you know and classification areas you know overlap with this type of work. Things like code clone detection, plagiarism detection. Um, I, I haven't looked personally at, at using a, an emulator or doing dynamic analysis to extract features and doing you know similarity comparisons. Um, it is an interesting idea. I think you know, it, you know, there's there's certainly you know lots of lots of good work that can come out of that. And I think it would be very interesting uh, to see the results. Thanks. Anybody else? Any questions? Oh, we got. Is that one at the front there that I saw? Um, I've got two questions. Uh, the software you've written to detect the embedded package relationships with vulnerability correlation, is it modular enough so that uh, probably we could write a plugin for it to, to embed it in a tool like, say, Yaska, so that we get the advantage of source code analysis as well as the vulnerability correlation that you are doing with embedded package detection? Um, I, I don't know that tool in particular, but. Um, uh I, I, at, at this point in time, I wouldn't say the software is very modular, but um, it's certainly possible to, to, to work on it. Um, I'm sort of, I, I'd like to do some more work on it because, um, and, and possibly even rewrite it to make it a, a, you know, a better implemented system. Um, it's certainly something that I'll have to think about. I mean, I hadn't, hadn't really considered um, if we can use this you know, in other you know, in source code analysis, in deeper analysis, and, and what we can use for that. And maybe things like even, maybe things like Visual Studio plugins could be an idea, or um, GCC plugins as well that can detect stuff. Um, could be could be somewhere to look at. And what sort of reporting uh, your software does? Can we extract our reports in XML? Say? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. It, you, yes. Uh, it actually produces all the embedded packages relationships in an XML format, and then I do a translation from the XML format to the Debian format, which is actually not a sort of a well-defined format. It was just sort of, because it was manually, um, the Debian track embedded package relationships are all manually generated. But I wanted you know, to, to incorporate it with Debian. So I first constructed an XML representation, then transformed it to the Debian um, format. As for like the reporting on the vulnerabilities, it, it basically generates a report such as, um, um, Firefox embeds libpng may be vulnerable to CVE 1234, uh, and it produces a list of that you know, in terms of the vulnerability, and then you go through the list and, and try to verify or, or, or tick off uh, each one that, is, that may or may not be true. Does it provide CVSS score as well, by any chance? No. You can just trans you can map those from the CVEs. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Okay, I'll ask the last one. You mentioned that the Fedora project has, has integrated the database um, to some extent. What exactly has been done there? So basically, um, they, they've, it, it's, not, it's not very complete, to be honest. Um, they, they've started taking the, the reports that I've given them of certain package relationships and basically built a wiki. I, I actually spent uh, quite a bit of email saying, you know, I think that I emailed them saying, I think you guys should you know, probably follow what Debian have done and create some sort of tracking system of embedded package relationships. I, I contacted the security response team, actually. This was, this was quite a while ago, I think um, last year, maybe. Um, um, and they said, yeah, they were interested, and they thought the best place for this was on the wiki. So there is actually a wiki page on the Fedora, um, like user-contributed wiki, um, that you can actually go, and it shows the relationships. Um, not a huge database at this point in time, but it certainly shows you know, a number of relationships saying that this package embeds that package and so forth. And um, I think the, the security uh, response team has, has, has been the people that have actually implemented that. Okay, cool. Uh, so thank you, Silvio. Can everybody give him a round of applause? <laughs>